So today we're very fortunate to have uh, Ross Stein here from the uh, Earthquake Science Center of the U.S. Geological Survey in nearby Menlo Park. Ross uh, is famous for studying earthquakes, in particular how earthquakes interact through stress transfer. He uh, has uh, been a, a distinguished speaker for AGU no less than three times, including the uh, Birch Lecture. Ross got his undergraduate degree, uh, magna cum laude, from Brown University, got his PhD here at Stanford. He's a fellow of both the American Geophysical Union and the Geological Society of America. Uh, I won't go through all the details, but uh, suffice it to say that Ross is one of the most cited uh, authors in all of earthquake science ever. He received the Eugene Shoemaker Distinguished Achievement Award of the USGS, Excellence and Outreach Award of the Southern California Earthquake Center, and Outstanding Contributions and Cooperation in Geoscience Award from NOAA. In 2009, he co-founded the Global Earthquake Model Foundation. This is a public-private partnership that is building a seismic risk model for the entire uh, planet. And Ross now chairs GEM's uh, science board. Ross has appeared in many documentary films uh, that have, have uh, won awards, including uh, films uh, developed by NOVA, uh, Discovery Channel, and National Geographic. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ross Stein as the uh, first SES Distinguished Lecture of 2014. Ross. I'm going to start over here. Greg, thank you for lying your head off. Um, when Dave Oppenheimer, who heads the Calif Northern California Seismic Network, uh, read the title of my talk, he said to me, well, now I know what you're going to wear, but I don't know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> so what I'm going to try to do is to give you an understanding of the fundamentals of earthquake science and take you to one of its frontiers. And everybody in the room is going to understand everything because everything is contained in this demo right here. Now, the Earth is surfaced by about a dozen shells. These shells are basically very stiff rubber sliding over silly putty. And they're, the interiors of these plates are constantly moving. And where they come into contact with, it, with each other, they get stuck. Whereas the interiors are moving for millimeters a year, the boundaries get stuck for hundreds of years and then suddenly jump forward in earthquakes where the slip is a meter or more. Now, why is it that we have earthquakes at all? Why not a kinder, gentler planet without <laughs> earthquakes and therefore without seismologists like David Oppenheimer? <laughs> and the answer to that question is contained here because there are four elements that you need to produce <coughs> earthquakes. And if you have these four, you always get earthquakes. And if you're missing any one of them, you never get earthquakes. And they are the steady motion of the plate's interiors, which in this experiment is represented by the steady cranking of this casting reel. Since it's a casting reel, we call this quake caster. Now these, the reel is connected through block and tackle to a rubber band, just a plain old rubber band. And that represents the rubberiness, the elasticity of the Earth's crust. It may not seem very rubbery to you, but it actually behaves as very stiff rubber. And they're connected to a mass. These are just granite countertop samples. And the mass is sitting, these sliders, on a non-skid surface, just like you get from Home Depot. That's all it is. So now what I want to do is just steadily crank this and we'll see what happens. And I just want you to watch so you can see it up there if you can't see it down here. Okay, did I get earthquakes? Did I do anything to make those earthquakes happen? Hopefully not. I didn't jerk anything. I tried to be as steady as I could. All right, let me ask you some more questions. Were the earthquakes all the same size? I want to shout out here. No. Were they all separated by the same amount of time? No. no. That's very bad news. If I can't make steady repeating earthquakes here with Home Depot sandpaper and a rubber band, we are never going to get them in the earth. 
we will never be able to talk about a fault being 10 months pregnant. <laughs> that variability that you see right here has got to be the minimum variability in the actual Earth because the elasticity of the Earth varies. Is it granite? Is it sediment? The friction on the fault undoubtedly varies more than this one, and still we don't get regular repeating behavior. Okay, let me repeat this. Now, by the way, here's the, the last guy who, who just moved when I stopped. Notice that there's still a lot of tension in this spring. Let me do that again. All right, we just had an earthquake. Look, there's still a lot of tension in the spring. We never get rid of all the tension. It never goes completely uh, relaxed, right? That's exactly what we see in the Earth. The total stress that the faults are under are something like 1,000 bars, 500 bars. But the earthquake only drops a stress about 30 bars, 40 bars. That means in California you are walking on eggshells. No fault spends, spends very much of its lifespan at very low stress. Almost all the faults are very close to failure at all times. That's good news and bad news. It's bad news for you, but it's good news for things I'm going to show you that allow us to make predictive statements about earthquake occurrence. Okay, let me ask you another question. Is there anything you see here that you would call a foreshock? And I should just say, it's a demo. And what a demo means is I can't make it do anything. It's going to behave the way it's going to be. There's no right or wrong answers. That's why discriminating audiences should always demand demos. <laughs> when I show you my slides, I know exactly what they're going to look like. There are no surprises. This thing has surprises. OK, anything that you would want to call a foreshot? Nothing very much, right? Maybe one or two times it wiggled a little bit beforehand. Maybe you heard a, gr a grain of sand break, but you probably heard grains of sand breaks between earthquakes and not necessarily right before. That's exactly what we see in the Earth. Four shocks were going to be our big deal. Four shocks were going to be easy because we saw in 1934, 17 and a half minutes between, before the Parkfield earthquake, the magnitude 6, there was a 5 a kilometer to the north. In 1966, 18 minutes before the magnitude 6, there was a magnitude 5, same spot. We said, oh, this is easy. Just put out seismometers, measure foreshocks, and you're done. But in retrospect, foreshocks behave just like this. They are about as dependable as your children. <laughs> they do not occur in any kind of predictive fashion. And even in retrospect, we cannot tell a foreshock apart from any other shock at all. So foreshocks are a complete washout in terms of the ability to predict earthquakes. So we just knocked down two things, regularity in space and time and the ability to give us something in advance. So that's not very good. OK, so what else can we do here? Um, another thing I want to show you is that each time I run this thing, it builds up a little bit of powder on the surface. And believe it or not, that powder isn't just coming from the breaking of the sand grains. It's coming from the bottom of the granite. And the granite, we, granite is a very, very rough surface, Peter Fielder. We sand, had it sandblasted at a, at a motorcycle uh, shop. And so even though it's been sandblasted, it actually loses grain. So the fault here is building up a powdery surface, which will eventually make it lower friction which I get rid of with my mustache brush. But the interesting thing about that is that any fault that is straight, that has a lot of slip, builds up a tremendous amount of this powder from ground down rock. And what happens to that powder is rainwater gouges it out and makes a big trough in the landscape. And that's why right here we have the San Andreas Lake and Crystal Springs Reservoir. There are simply the places where rock has been ground to powder and then gets washed out. That's what a fault looks like unless it's bent. If a fault bends, one side can go up, one side can go down. Otherwise, we get these kind of uh, features because of the gouge, because of the powder that's produced. OK, now, what would happen if I take one brick off and I'm cranking at the same San Andreas speed here of an inch a year, 
Uh, here's what I want to ask you to make a prediction. Am I going to get more earthquakes, more frequent earthquakes or less? How many people say more? Raise your hands. How many people say less? Somebody write this down. No. <laughs> okay. Some people. The same. Okay. And what about, are they going to be separated? Uh, are they going to be larger or smaller? How many people say larger? How many people say smaller? Okay. So here we go. So, smaller, quicker, right? And what is interesting about that is I'm cranking at the same speed. We have the same elasticity as all I'm doing is reducing the mass. And you can see why that is so. Because the resistance here is the weight of the brick times the friction coefficient. We've had the weight, so it goes earlier. And that means the same fault, the same San Andreas, with the same materials. If we can find a one bricker spot, it'll produce earthquakes more frequently. And we have such a spot. That's that Parkfield site that I mentioned before. They're actually one-tenth the size of the big ones and 10 times the frequency, something like 20 or 30 years between them. And in 1980, we at the survey decided, with a little bit too much hope than wisdom, that these earthquakes were very regular and that we could call the occurrence of the next one, which was called to be 1985, give or take five years. And that Parkfield earthquake did arrive. It arrived like my wife, Sharon. Egregiously late, but well worth waiting for. <laughs> and by that I mean, because we knew it was a coming, we got all the instruments in the ground. And because we always run late, it was good that the earthquake was late. And we had instruments that could measure pressure changes deep in the earth equivalent to a volume change the same as dropping a jigger of gin in Lake Tahoe. And we saw nothing before that earthquake. So that again tells you how extraordinarily difficult the problem of earthquake prediction is. This magnitude six did not give itself away. <coughs> okay. Now, let me show you something else. So I have this rough surface. On the other side, I have the shiny surface, so you know how smooth it is. OK, so I'm just going to put it upside down here. So I'm only changing the friction on one side of the fault. The other side of the fault is identical, right? So now what, are, what do you expect in terms of behavior? Are we going to get more earthquakes or less? More, more. Are we going to be smaller or larger? You're getting good. Look at that. Barely get earthquakes at all. We get little, little kind of chatter, but basically it's just creeping along. So it's, everything else is the same. Same speed, same elasticity in the crust. If I can get the friction on the fault down very, very low, I don't get earthquakes. Or I can get many, many little earthquakes. <coughs> many, many little earthquakes without any big guys whatsoever. And we have such a place on the San Andreas between um, Hollister and Parkfield. It creeps every day. It's creeped for 10,000 years. It does not produce large earthquakes. And it's probably a place, interestingly, where we have granite on one side, sediments on the other. So it's probably actually only smooth on one side of the fault, too. And yet, if you can create enough of this powder in the fault zone, and that powder seems to have a lot of clay in it, then you can get this dramatically different behavior with everything else the same. OK. So now, in the real world, we have very few faults that are isolated. Faults tend to come as groups. So what about the interaction of a group? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put three on in series. So, we, so for example, the San Andreas is about 1,000 kilometers long. But the biggest earthquakes that we know on the fault are not that big. They're maybe 300 kilometers long. So if we connect three guys up, what are we going to see? OK. OK, who's going first? First click, second, or third? You just shout it out. Who's going second? Who's going third? Could be a trick question. You never know. OK, so here we go. It's 
So it gets interesting really fast, right? <laughs> I mean, you were really good when you said the first one goes first, and then your, your, your whole predictions went to hell. And that's because things get very interesting. Once the first one goes, it tensions the second one. Once the second one goes, it tensions the third one, but it also removes the tension on the first guy so he can go again. And occasionally, you saw them all go at once. And that's exactly what we see. We have faults. For example, in 1979, we had a magnitude 5.5 on the Homestead Valley Fault. On the same fault in 1992, it ruptured in all directions and produced a magnitude 7.3. Same fault. It's just that three bricks went at once in one earthquake, whereas typically, maybe they would go one at a time. So this kind of interaction is part of the story of earthquakes. It is extremely rare to see a fault in isolation. And it was really the desire to see that uh, greater connection of earthquakes that I want to show you the next experiment uh, that we made. But before leaving that, I just want to say that Quakecaster was built by Kelsey Linton, and she had never used a screwdriver before. She designed and prototyped and built this. She did it, built a teacher's guide. She taught it with um, sixth graders and insurance executives. We know which one did a better job. <laughs> and. Um, wrote two scientific papers, and she was a high school student. When I realized what I had on my hands, I bought out all of her babysitting hours. <laughs> OK, so now what we needed was a two-dimensional elastic membrane. So here, I'm replacing the rubber band with this fishnet stocking. So I'm going to start, and I have these little sliders. So I'm going to start with just one single biggish slider. So we still have the rubberiness, but the rubberiness is now in the fishnet. And I want to just show you its behavior. So I think you can see, it looks a lot like the single double stack that we had before. Whoops. In the sense that, it wasn't particularly regular, but we had big earthquakes. And the other nice thing about this guy is that you can see, I think you can see, the buildup of stress. So now before it's ruptured, you can see that kind of stress wing. And you can see it's not just going to affect things along the line, it's going to affect things to the side too. OK, so now let, we've got that big guy. And so now I'm going to put a little guy in too. And I'm going to put a little guy over here, so they're far apart from each other. And our prediction, right, is that this guy should have twice as many earthquakes as this guy, right? So let's see if that happens. You can almost just close your eyes and hear the difference. Can you see and hear that the little guy is moving quite a bit more frequently than the big guy? But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get them close to each other. Not super close, but just kind of in the same neighborhood. Now look. Now the little guy is more or less doing what the big guy does. It doesn't know it's a little fault anymore. It's a captive. It does have a few more earthquakes, but it almost always moves when the big guy does. That's what the Hayward Fault is. The Hayward Fault is 100 kilometers long. The San Andreas is 1,000 kilometers long. They're 10 kilometers apart from each other. The Hayward is simply a captive of the San Andreas. Its behavior would be totally different if you put it into Kansas. And so we get earthquakes that are spread apart farther in time and bigger than we would otherwise have on the fault of that size because it is very strongly influenced, both in terms of when it has an earthquake and when it doesn't from the big guy. So now let me take this a little bit farther and say, all right, let's be a little bit more realistic because in the real world we have lots of patches which seismologists call asperities on the fault at any one time. So now I've got a bunch of guys and I'm going to give, put sliders of different weights on top of each one of them. Try to keep them so they're not too close to the edge. 
And you can think of this in two ways. You could think of this as, well, this is the fault systems in the Bay Area, San Gregorio, San Andreas, Hayward, Calaveras, or you can think you're looking at the subduction zone. You're looking at the Juan de Fuca plates jamming itself underneath the Pacific Northwest, and you're looking on that surface, what we call a megathrust surface, or you're looking at the Japan Trench, where we just had the magnitude 9. And now, look at what happens here. So now we're getting lots of chatter. We're getting lots, we're getting some interactions. Sometimes you see cascades. Occasionally it has kind of a structure to it. This is what seismic catalogs look like. All this crosstalk, it's really a symphony of interactions, which if you have no other tools, you say, hmm, sounds random. Well, kind of sounds random, but you can see here that there are still strong interactions going on as long as these guys are close enough to each other. And this is what seismic catalogs really contain, and this is what we have to understand to figure out how earthquakes work. Okay, so I'm about to go to the slides, but um, this fishnet is great, but it didn't start out that way because originally Jeremy Shar from Brown University, who was my intern on this project, and I were looking for a very thin elastic membrane, very stretchy and very tear resistant. So of course, being a scientist, I thought condoms. So we rushed out on my USGS credit card and bought cases of condoms. <laughs> and we were tearing those capsules open and we were measuring their thickness, they're just incredible, three hundredths of an inch. <laughs> their elastic modulus, their Poisson's ratio, their yield strength. I know everything about condoms. <laughs> and at one point, Volkan Sevelgen, who's a colleague of mine, went into my office and he looked at my trash can and he says, are you out of your mind? You've got all these condom wrappers. John the janitor talks to everyone. <laughs> so after that, we started treating the condom wrappers like hazmat. <laughs> so condoms are really, really great, but they're too small. That was our problem. So we said, well, this is no big deal. You know, we'll just go to an industrial supply place like McMaster Carr, and we order their latex inferior. So we said, okay, we know that there's got to be latex specialty shops online. So we went to those. They're really interesting. <laughs> the biggest one is called Radical Rubber, but my favorite is Club Rub. They had never used a survey credit card before. They didn't understand tax exempt. But we ordered from Club Rub inferior, inferior to Trojans. So on my USGS stationery, I wrote the CEO of Trojans and asked for their source, and I got back a curt reply, corporate secret. <laughs> now, actually, there isn't a CEO of Trojans because the company is Church and Dwight. I think they're thinking Catholic Church, I don't know. But in any event, I thought, you know, why don't you just call the comp? Oh, and the other thing about Church and Dwight, their cover product is Arm and Hammer baking soda. So I think they really should call themselves Arm, Hammer, and Condom, and then they would be a full service corporation. So we were at a loss. We had nowhere to go. And then, then all of, I was watching, I think I was watching a rerun of Pretty Woman on television. That, oh, fishnet stockings. And that was my biggest scientific breakthrough. <laughs> and then, then we were off and running and we were very, very happy. Okay, so what I want to do now is uh, I'm going to take this guy off. Put this on just for demonstration purposes. And now we're going to go to some slides to look at how all of this plays out in the three-dimensional world of actual earthquake sequences because as Buckminster Fuller liked to say, there's no observational evidence for two dimensions. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what you're looking at is the site of the 1999 Izmit earthquake, a magnitude 7.6 event on the North Anatolian Fault. And I'm going to show you the same kind of fishnet stocking kind of illustration to show you how we calculate the Coulomb failure stress. And actually, Sorry, Joel, I'm going to switch back for a minute. I needed to do one more thing, one more crucial thing. Okay, this guy is about ready to go, right? What's going to happen when I lift the top rail? 
What's going to happen if I lift the top brick? I need to hear it. That's right. Because I've unclamped the fault. The fault is under these enormous clamping stresses, right? Equally so, what happens if I get it about ready to go and I pull a little bit on the spring? I'm not causing the earthquake, I can trigger it. And I can only trigger it if it's close to failure. If I do it now, nothing. If I do it now, nothing. If a fault is close to failure, then pulling on the spring or lifting a brick, and this is called the Coulomb criteria, will trigger potentially earthquakes around it. It only works if faults are close to failure. But I already told you, most faults are close to failure almost all the time. Okay, so now, sorry, now we're gonna go back to this. So here we go. So I'm gonna put the fault up here. I'm gonna put a grid across the fault, simplify the fault with a straight line, densify the grid, and as these squares shear into parallelograms, I'm increasing the shear stress. I'm pulling on the, on the rubber band. And after the rupture, you can see that out here, they've even gotten more deformed. So these red areas are where I have pulled on the spring. The blue areas are where I've relaxed the spring. Now we're gonna, you can see that we've stretched this and compressed this. So this is an area where I've lifted the bricks and this is where I've added a brick. And we combine those two criteria and that gives us the Coulomb failure uh, condition. So it says that once we've had this big rupture here, this is a strike slip earthquake like the San Andreas, then beyond either end, we've pulled on the spring, and out here we've lifted bricks. So these yellow-red areas are where we could get the next earthquake. And the blue areas are what we call the stress shadow, where earthquakes are less likely. So that's how we go, just from what you've seen over there, to something closer to the real world. And now I'm going to show you how that plays out in the largest falling domino sequence we've ever experienced on the North Anatolian Fault, which is the San Andreas' wicked sister. In every respect, the same beast, but in another country. Okay, 1939, look at the red blowtorch zones beyond the end. 1943, 44, these two guys are gonna get filled, this guy's gonna get filled, 57, 67, and finally, centered on Ismet, the 1999 earthquake. So this view suggests that earthquakes can trigger each other in a kind of a cascade fashion when everything is very, very close to failure. And work like this was done that identified Ismet over here as this site and this site as the two parts of this thousand kilometer fault that were closest to failure. What happened after that? The Ismet earthquake then struck and my uh, close collaborator, Aikut Barka, a month after that earthquake, published this paper and this figure in Science Magazine, where he said, the 1999 earthquake has brought this fault, the Duzje fault and the Yelova fault, closer to failure. And therefore, there was an increased risk of earthquakes in the months and years following this event. What happened was that after the earthquake in Duzje, you can see Duzje is very close to the end of the rupture, almost all of the school buildings were damaged, but lightly damaged. And October rolled around, it started to get cold, and the principals of those schools uh, appealed to the government to allow those schools to reopen because the kids, because it was cold and kids had nowhere to go and there was going to be no instruction if the schools could not be occupied and they weren't strongly damaged. But because Aikut was credible, and because he had published this in a highly reputable scientific journal, the engineers had a reason to say no to the principals. And then, two months later in November, the Duzje earthquake, this fault ruptured in a magnitude 7.1 earthquake, and almost every one of those schools fell. So this is one of those rare moments when a scientific discovery leads to something valuable. <laughs> Maybe that was a little bit too revealing. <laughs> but the sad thing is that three years after this, uh, this publication, Aikut himself was dead as a result of a car accident and abysmally poor medical services in his country. 
Now, the, as I mentioned, the San Andreas and the North Anatolian Fault are very similar. So we switch over to the San Andreas, which is here. We're in Southern California. There's LA. This is that Lander's earthquake, the three bricker I re referred to you before. And here, in calculations done much later after the earthquake, are the stresses set up by that earthquake with blowtorch zones beyond the ends and to the side. And here's the first three hours of aftershocks. You can see a bunch over here, one or two here, one here, and some down here. And here's what happened three minutes and three hours and eight minutes later, a magnitude 6.5 here. Is it an aftershock? Is it a, what is it? Well, what matters is that earthquake is in some sense contingent on the preceding event and in some sense predictable. Not in a hard and fast sense, but a site where the probabilities increased. Now, a skeptical member of the audience, and you should be, because that's what scientists are, would say, mm, you could almost throw a dart on this map and have at least a one out of three chance of hitting a red zone as opposed to a blue zone, the stress shadow. But we do have 10,000 other aftershocks, and they tell much the same story. Most of the seismicity is occurring in the places where either we've pulled on the spring or we've lifted a brick. And the places where we've stacked another brick on or relaxed the spring are the stress shadows, the blue zones. Now again, a skeptical audience would say, yeah, but you do have some earthquakes in the shadows. So doesn't that falsify the hypothesis? No matter how close they were to failure, you brought it farther from failure, so why would you get earthquakes there? And that's a very difficult question, but our answer to that is what we would expect in those shadow zones is that the earthquakes will occur at a lower rate than they did beforehand, not that they would completely shut off. So we've looked at that, and we've looked at that this way. There was a magnitude 6 earthquake two months before Landers, just to the south. So here's the big Landers event. Here's the 6. And all of the shocks that occurred between that main shock and when Landers struck are colored blue. And you can see that these guys, after Landers occurs, they're colored red. This is purply because the seismicity continued. But over here, there's no red because the seismicity shut down. And if we calculate the trigger and shadow zones, you can see these guys are in the shadow zone, so they should have shut down. And if we gather up all the earthquakes in this zone and plot them here, you can see that they were rising, and at the moment, Lander, within a couple of days of Lander's occurring, they all but shut down. This isn't flat. There's still earthquakes, but at a much lower rate. Whereas in the trigger zone, when Lander's occurs, they actually take off. So this supports this idea that what Coulomb stress is doing is changing the rate of occurrence of things, or if you're talking about big earthquakes, the probabilities of occurrence. It is not a switch that just shuts on and off. Okay. Now remember that I showed you that when I had this creeping zone, by turning this upside down, the thing just slid along. And that meant that I never actually tensioned the spring very much, right? Only if I stack up and have a high friction do I ever get a lot of tension on the spring. So a creeping fault has the behavior that since we never tension the spring very much, I can push it one way or the other. Whereas if this guy had been like this, I can't push it this way. So creeping zone is very, very sensitive to changes in stress, in particular, backwards changes in stress. So let me show you what happened on the San Andreas in 1983 when there were a couple of magnitude sixes earthquakes which cast a stress increase zone and a shadow zone here. And this is, these are creep meters, wires stretched across the fault. And you can see in the stress shadow zone, the fault went backwards. It's a right lateral fault, which means the other side goes to the right. And when this earthquake occurred, the fault reversed. So this is the stress imposed by the Kalinga earthquakes. Right laterally, like the fault normally goes here. Left laterally here, and the fault goes backwards. So that again suggests that these stress changes are very important when you can find conditions that allows the fault to respond to even small stresses. Okay, what about the Bay Area? So here's the picture of earthquakes in the 75 years, more or less from just before the gold rush until 1906. So we had sixes and sevens ricocheting all over the Bay. This was a very lively place. 
Now let me show you the 75 years after 1906. Very quiet. And we believe that that quiet was caused by the stress shadow of the 1906 earthquake, which shut down or very, very much reduced the earthquake ability of the surrounding faults. And this is the Hayward Fault, the San Andreas, the San Gregorio, and the Calaveras. Now Fred Pollitz and his colleagues have calculated the cumulative stress since that time till now, and here's what it looks something like this today. Now, why is it so red? Because it's still cranking. So no matter how much 1906 dropped the stress, it's coming back. The only part of the system which isn't back is the 1906 rupture itself because that's the one place where the stress dropped a great deal. But this is a very simplified view of the fall that's probably got high stress knots too, but what you really see is this kind of blood over here in the East Bay, which is exactly where we're beginning to see moderate earthquakes occur. And that suggests that in some sense, we have to keep reloading this system it's going to start to produce large earthquakes again, probably from the East Bay first, but who knows where the stress is building up on the San Andreas because our sense of the distribution of slip in 1906 is very poor. Okay, so at this point, it might put you in the mood for a little bit of gallows humor. <laughs> Today, this is a joke's a little old. Today, they'd say, would you like to pay for the plastic? <laughs> Okay, and so this is where my thinking was in terms of how earthquakes interact, with these interactions being thinking about the fishnet stocking on faults that are relatively close together, even for the largest earthquakes we've seen, let's say the 9.2 in Sumatra, it means interactions on a scale of about 400 kilometers, 250 miles. So that's what, what my thinking was until April 11th, 2012 when an extraordinary event occurred, a magnitude 8.7 earthquake off Sumatra in the Indian Ocean. And immediately after that earthquake occurred, we began to see, or I began to notice, ap shocks occurring all over the place. Now, there's something you should know about this earthquake. 8.7 is hardly the largest earthquake we've experienced in the last decade, but it's the largest strike-slip earthquake ever to be recorded by a factor of 10. So this was truly a unique event. Now, here's the distribution I saw for these earthquakes. This is actually the first six days. And you look at these and you go, you know, this is just where earthquakes always occur. Nothing different here. Nothing at all. You always get most earthquakes occurring around the Pacific Rim, plus, you know, a few wild cards here and there. So there doesn't really seem to be anything special about that. And further, if by chance, these earthquakes were related to the main shock. You might expect to see more of them closer to the main shock because the seismic waves diminish and dissipate as you get farther away. And you certainly don't see that here at all. In fact, maybe you even see the reverse. So I said, okay, there's nothing. All right, what's the next thing one would do? You just kind of look at the earthquakes, let's say for the six days afterwards and compare them to the earthquakes for the six days before. And there was an, in it was higher, but I, didn't see, it wasn't importantly higher. What was really strange about this is I was having dinner with Sharon at Sultana in Menlo Park, and my phone kept buzzing, and I would pull it out, and it would say, earthquake, somewhere or other. And, and I thought, you know, this is just heightened sense of awareness that happens after a big event. So that's where I was, and Fred Pollitz came running in my office and said, have you seen all these earthquakes? And I said, yeah, but they're not related. And he goes, you're wrong, they're related. I said, no, and he said, come to my office. And he showed me an early version of this picture. So this is the number of events per day as a function of time. And there is a huge spike at the time of this earthquake, and then a rapid decay. And subsequently, Fred figured out various ways to establish kind of what the background rate is, whether or not it's the black or the gray or the green. The green is the most stringent test Fred could figure out. And still, for at least a couple of days, this rate is much higher than what the average is or what had occurred before. So be I began to realize how wrong I was. So we said, well, look, if this 8.7 can produce global aftershocks, what about the 9.2? That's 20 times larger. What about the 9.0 in Japan? What about the 8.8 .8 in Chile? So we took all of the worst offenders, we, you know, we just kind of round up the usual suspects, and then we stacked them to see how they would look. And this is how they look. 
That's kind of an eye of the beholder figure. If you believe it, you can convince yourself it's there. If you're skeptical, you could convince yourself it's not there. So at this point, it still looked interesting but unclear. So because I'm a very sophisticated scientist, I went back, and, and you can see I have lots of inflatable globes. I got one of my inflatable globes. I put sticky dots on where all the earthquakes were. Where's the main shock? There's the main shock. And I took rubber bands, as you can imagine, I have quite a rubber band collection. <laughs> and I put rubber bands parallel to the fault and perpendicular to the fault, and I could more or less get rubber bands to go through all these shocks. So that looked interesting. So I ran in with my rubber ball to Fred's office, <laughs> and he goes, oh, that's the love wave propagation. That's how love waves propagate around the Earth. And you thought you knew love waves. You're not a seismologist. So Fred said, let me make a model. So Fred goes in, and he builds a three-dimensional, viscoelastic, spherically harmonic model of the love wave propagation with all the layers and phases in the Earth, and he produces this. Now I ask you, which is better, Fred's obviously show-off-y model <laughs> or my middle school science fair entry? And in case you don't really know the right answer, I put a gold star here to give you a hint which one you should be voting for. So, okay, what this is interesting, but remember, it doesn't prove anything. It's a consistency test. If it had failed, we'd be in trouble. But the fact that it is somehow consistent, well, this is where earthquakes are all the time. So that isn't enough. So the interesting thing about love waves, our love waves are produced by strike-slip earthquakes, and the love wave motion is like this. So if you are a vertical strike-slip fault, that may trigger you. Whereas if you're a thrust fault, this isn't doing anything for you, because you don't, faults are probably crenulated like potato chips. They only go in their certain directions. So Fred said, let's look and see if these earthquakes around the world are preferentially strike-slip. And we did that. He saw something really remarkable, that in the first few days, two-thirds of the earthquakes around the world were strike-slip, whereas typically only a quarter of them are. And it had that rapid decay, just the way we saw for the other earthquakes. So now things are getting interesting. But OK, if what really matters here is that it's a large strike-slip earthquake, then the other large strike-slip earthquakes that we've had should also produce global aftershocks. So I said, all right, let me look at that. So I rounded up those suspects. So first, this 8.1, 43 events before, 43 events afterwards, that's dead. Tasman Sea earthquake, it occurred two and a half days before the Sumatra Boxing Day earthquake, so we can only look at two and a half days, but it only has a few more afterwards than before, so let's say that's no good. 1906, we actually can't even detect earthquakes smaller reliably than about 7.7, .7. we can look at a longer time period before and after, nothing. Nothing before, nothing after. And finally, the next largest strike slip earthquakes ever recorded, a pair of 8.3s in Mongolia, that are 140 kilometers and two weeks apart. Those two guys are definitely fishnet stocking kind of earthquakes that are feeling each other. But in terms of anything that they produced globally, nothing. So this just really didn't work. It just really didn't work. <laughs> and there's a lot of research like that. And then I stumbled upon one more thing that was, that was interesting. Kind of asking this question, so why is this earthquake such an overachiever? And I looked at the week or two before this earthquake. And this is the number of earthquakes every 12 days around the world. And the 12 days before this earthquakes are extraordinarily quiet. This earthquake occurred after the quietest two weeks we've ever had in the last 40 years. And all the other big ones that we looked at happened to have occurred during noisier times. So Here's what I think is going on. Imagine you have an apple tree. And an apple tree is maybe the apples are ripening and maybe one is dropping a day. That's what's normally happened, but they're not very regular, right? And if you happen to go through a 12-day period where no apples fall, then you probably have many more apples on the tree that are really, really overripe. What do the love's waves do? They rush up and shake the trunk of the tree 
And so if you've had that period, then maybe you'll get much more falling than normal. So maybe that's what explains it. So as the uh, piece de resistance, which I'm pretty sure means piece of resistance, I'm going to show you how this plays out with in the real life. So I'm going to call up Max Willis here, who's, who's uh, my current intern making another cool piece of demo equipment. Okay, so what I want to do here, let's back it up. What I'm going to do is Max is going to be the love wave and he's going to slam the table. And what I want you to see or want you to find out is whether or not you see any effect of the table slam. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Pretty subtle, right? Yeah. All right, now let's try this. I'll just stop it at one point so we don't hear all the noise and then we'll see what happens. Did you see one move? Yeah. All right, let me do it again. It's very subtle. It barely changes the picture, but you see some response. And in fact, now I want you to, this isn't like touchy-feely. I want you to just close your eyes and listen and see if you, if you hear any cessation of events after he does the slam. Maybe, maybe not, right? This is a very subtle feature. You can see it, you can see why it would occur, but it's remarkable how little it does. And that's, thank you, Max, that's exactly the case because we figure, <laughs> Max is a younger, better looking version of me. Um, we figure that there are about 200,000 sites on faults capable of producing these five and a half earthquakes. We had 16 and probably five or six of them would have occurred anyway. So it is a very, very subtle feature that you can just see in this. And so that's where I want to leave you with the sense that um, you've seen how difficult the earthquake prediction problem is. You, you've seen something of the um, excitement of uh, collaborative uh, research and discoveries, and you've also seen that occasionally, very rarely, science and scientists conspire actually to save lives. Thank you. And I'd like to just say, um, Jeremy Shar's parents in the room, would you just stand up and we'll give you a shout out. <laughs> and I think uh, Kelsey's mom is in the room, is that right? She was going to be, yes, Kelsey's mom is here too, and I really appreciate them. And Fred Pollitz is here, so Fred, would you stand up? Okay. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Yes. It must have been at least uh, 50 years ago or better that we started hearing uh, events, especially from the Soviet Union, where they were detecting increased gas emission in deep wells that seemed to be precursors for faulting. Has anything further been done or explored in that area? So the gentleman asks if there is uh, gas emissions before earthquakes. Virtually everything we try is a dud. A dud in the sense that it may have happened one time, but it doesn't happen in a dependable manner. And so um, I know of nothing that is uh, workable, despite the fact that there are various groups, companies out there selling predictions. Um, there really is nothing that we can find that is reliable, gas emission included. Yes. After Loma Prieta, the earthquake expert that works with my company uh, told us that the next big fault will be centered on page number 280. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
What do we know about the San Andreas in our neighborhood? It produced in 1838 a magnitude 7. Um, it doesn't just produce magnitude 8s. It's capable of producing a 7 at any time. Roughly speaking, the San Andreas has its very large earthquakes on the, um, on the order of several hundred years apart, and we're only about 100 years downstream. I would say that the uh, earthquake I was just talking about, the 8.6, it actually might be an 8.7, is a reminder that we've assumed that the San Andreas can produce nothing larger than an 8.1. And I think once we've seen now that you can have a much larger strike slip event, we need to think more broadly about earthquake possibilities on our fault. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, you've, I don't know if this is true or not, but you read in the newspaper or in other publications that animals get a sense of things that are arising and, and, and behave strangely just before an earthquake occurs. I don't know if that's true, but if it is, has somebody investigated what it is they're sensing? Well, those views were brought on by the observation before the 1976 Tenshin earthquake, uh, where there were apparently large reports of farm animals behaving strangely and snakes coming out of holes in February and things like that. So in that instance, there appears to have been something that disturbed animals. But there's nothing that's reliably seen in animal behavior before earthquakes. And so it's yet another dead end. And I think, you know, that what underlies this is that the faults are moving inches a year, and in the space of three seconds, they accelerate to 5,000 miles an hour. It is a runaway process that does not give itself away, and the best laboratory evidence suggests that the precursory process might be confined, even for a magnitude 8, in a region the size of this room, and that region is 10 miles down. Yes? Well, we uh, pay a lot of attention, obviously, given our neighborhood, to the San Andreas. Uh, has an equal amount of attention been paid to uh, what's happening uh, around New Madrid and, uh, say, Juan de Fuca up to the northwest? Yes, quite a bit. So the New Madrid area experienced a large earthquake in 1811 and 1812. These are fishnet stocking earthquakes. They're separated by several months, and they're more or less in the same uh, uh, vicinity of each other. Uh, it's a very odd place to, pre to have large earthquakes occurring, but it does seem to have a prehistory of them. So it's a debated and important area because people are not building for earthquake preparedness there. In Cascadia, in the Pacific Northwest, I think people are well aware that there is historical evidence for a magnitude 9 in 1700, and, and we could have such an earthquake again. So I think in both areas, there's a great deal of research taking place, and they're both tough problems. Linda? Um, in terms of uh, the model that you just showed, what um, explains earthquakes in places like Texas and Oklahoma where there's not normally earthquakes um, that seem to be associated with fracking, for instance? So um, Bill Ellsworth recently published a, uh, a figure in science that's really startling. And it shows the rate of earthquakes in the entire Midwest, starting from the time we could measure, I think, magnitude two and a half and larger, maybe it's magnitude three and larger, from about 1980. And it's extremely steady rate, kind of like the steady cranking of this thing. And then in about 2000, the rate climbs by a factor of four or five, and it's still climbing. And that climb is associated with the beginning of oil field operation there. And so the evidence is that it is not the fracking that causes the earthquakes. It's the reinjection of the fracking fluids deep into the earth. So in broad sense, the uh, increased seismic activity in these regions is related to oil field ac activity or gas activity. Um, if you go to any particular field, it's kind of like fighting words, of course, because cause and effect is difficult to prove. It's like an epidemiological answer to the question rather than a forensic answer. Yes? Um, in terms of the study of the uh, earthquake, besides the, I mean, besides the uh, physical changes that you observe and you do some measurement, 
is there any like a uh, measurement or study of uh, like the sound wave for like radiation in certain ways? So I'm thinking about the question that's uh, um, brought up about the animal thing, and I read something about that too. Uh, that might have something to do with some <coughs> kind of sound wave. So any study on that uh, uh, aspect? So a sound wave is simply, uh, if, if I hit the table, you can hear something because sound waves are traveling through the table and popping out the other side. And so seismologists uh, blow off charges and use earthquakes to sample the crust by sending sound waves through. And there's some evidence of changes of behavior uh, over some time period, particularly after earthquakes, less so beforehand. So the answer is seismologists are always looking for a way to use seismic waves, sound waves in the earth, to see if they can detect precursory phenomena. But thus far, nobody has seen anything reliable. Okay, besides sound, any other thing that they detected as well? Well, we can measure the, the deformation of the Earth's surface, but again, we're not seeing anything that's revealing. And on the Earth's surface, you're a long way from where this earthquake is starting or stopping. Yes? I was wondering if you could comment on kind of um, your, your thoughts on best practices for communicating this kind of probabilistic risk to both the public and policymakers. C kind of particularly, I'm thinking of um, the instance in Italy with the L'Aquila earthquake and the subsequent prosecution of the seismologist. So it's a very difficult problem how to, dis how to provide people with information which is as uncertain as probabilities. <laughs> and in a sense, um, at the USGS and those of us who do this, who, who, who make probabilistic forecasts, we're, we're in the best racket going because we give you numbers and you can't prove us wrong. <laughs> and so we have to be very, very humble about this and recognize that it's extremely difficult to test the basis of those numbers. So we have to just, uh, <coughs> you know, we make a compact with the public. And that is uh, we need to tell them what we know and we need to tell them what we don't know. Even if that makes them say, forget about it, what you don't know so outweighs what you know I'm not listening. And that's my general strategy. We have to be very, very upfront about all the unknowns n because otherwise we will lose credibility even though we are not providing, we are not gaining the action that we would like to have happen. Yes? Oh, uh, it, it, what did the uh, Italian geologists do wrong that ended up with them in court being Four of the seven uh, Italians convicted of manslaughter are my friends, so I'm not exactly an objective outsider. And at the USGS where I work, we're not allowed to talk about, the, make any official statements because it's a sovereign country and it's considered to be um, interference by the US government. What I can say is that this is a tragic situation in which most of those who were convicted said nothing whatsoever about earthquake prediction. And uh, the seismologist was just providing seismic data, the engineer was just providing engineering expertise, uh, politicians were involved, and um, it's taken on a, a life of its own, and it's, it's, it's a terrible tragedy for those involved, and it's a tragedy for all of us, reflecting on your question too, in the willingness of people to step forward and try to say what it is where we know and what we don't know. Yes? Do you foresee a time where it's time dependence of uh, it's time variation and seismic hazard will <coughs> be incorporated in the probabilistic seismic hazard maps that we use for building design? It's a great question. So in general, for most building design work, uh, people assume that earthquakes are occurring randomly in time and that we ignore the fact that we might be in the aftershock period of a large earthquake or something like that. And I, for one, would advocate building these kind of time dependences into seismic risk and hazard analysis. I think the, the opportunity is there. The data is extremely strong now. Um, an example of this is that the magnitude 9 Tohoku earthquake stopped about 100 kilometers short of Tokyo. But Tokyo experienced, just underneath Tokyo, they experienced a tenfold increase in seismicity rate. And it's still three times higher today than it was before the Tohoku earthquake. And so in my judgment, they clearly have a higher hazard. And whatever hazard was used before is no longer appropriate. 
Um, we don't know that the probability of larger earthquakes has increased, but we can see that this that the uh, rate of moderate earthquakes has increased, and it seems to me that's that's very strong uh, factor. Chuck. A while back, I visited a company that had a um, early warning system that was based, I believe, it was on a, a, a vertical wave that travels faster than the horizontal wave and they might be able to give a few seconds notice and turn off or on emergency systems. Do you know anything about that? So earthquake early warning is, uh, is really the fallback. If we can't predict earthquakes and if the best we can do is probabilities, then one strategy is to just beat the detect the earthquake and beat the information back to you before the shaking has begun. And there are uh, very strong efforts in California to build an earthquake early warning system. There is one in Japan and Istanbul and Mexico City. And some of these systems use the P wave arrival, which has much weaker shaking but is much faster to trigger. And but there are much more sophisticated systems that are being envisaged here. Some of them use uh, a, a dense array of seismic instrumentation along the fault. Others will use are that, that are very exciting idea of crowdsourcing this through the use of uh, everybody's cell phones, laptops, cars, and there are some incredible opportunities, I think, around the corner for making early warning, earthquake early warning, a reality uh, through your own uh, consumer electronics. And that doesn't use a P wave, it uses much more sophisticated tools, uh, the GPS and the gyros and the accelerometers and all of our personal equipment. I want to I close this off um, with a bit of an admonition and a confession. Uh, when my little daughter was five, she leaned over me, to me in a movie theater and said, Dad, would you take me to the confession stand? <laughs> so, so I'm on my way there now. <laughs> the evidence of the seismicity rate increase associated with these global aftershocks of the 2012 earthquake was right in front of my face, and I missed it. And I missed it because I knew it was impossible. I didn't believe we could get large earthquakes occurring around the world. We knew that very tiny earthquakes did this, but not large ones. And when you think about it, all big discoveries and little, and, and, and little ones like this one emerge from the unexpected. The bumper sticker of science should be question authority, even your own. And I was just very lucky that a colleague unblinded me. And so, you know, a comment I'd make, particularly to young scientists, is be alert to this. Be alert to the fact that the things you consider to be, your experience and judgment, can sometimes be bias. Now, I know this has no bearing on non-scientists because your spouse never reveals to you that your um, experience and judgment is, in fact, bias also. But I just want to leave you with that, uh, uh, that thought for me and the importance of, of staying alert to your own biases. Thank you very much.